Morning, Law family. So, first of all, let me be the first one to congratulate you for surviving the time change. You made it here in one piece. Let it be known that I, for one, am proud of you. And I'm proud of me, too. <laughs> but let's go ahead and just hop right into worship. We're going to do Holy as the Lord. So if you'll stand and join us in praise. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Glory, the earth is. 
scripture real quick. We're going to go into Psalm 18, 30 and 32. God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is pure. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. For who is a rock besides the Lord? And who is a rock? Only our God. God, he clothes me with strength and he makes my way perfect. God, thank you for guiding us. God, thank you for being our rock. In the darkest moments, as these mornings get harder, let us know that you're there. Let us know that you're always walking by our side. Even in our tiredness, even in whatever brokenness we bring from this week, let us know that you are with us, even in the desert. I will rejoice, I will declare. 
season You are still God I have a reason to sing I have a reason to worship All of my life In every season You are still God prayer in the harvest when favor and providence flow I know I'm filled to be emptied again this seed I've received I will sow Just how beautiful 
important moment in our worship together, the time of confession and assurance. This is a space for reflection, humility, and the embrace of God's boundless grace. It's an opportunity for us as a faith community to lay aside the weight of our missteps, to remember the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice for us. Those who, have, who might be new to this practice, please know this is a moment filled with grace, inviting us to acknowledge our failings and to receive the assurance of God's forgiveness. Let's enter this time with open and expectant hearts. Together as a family in Christ, let's bring our confessions to the Lord. Join me in prayer. Lord God, we confess that we have sometimes allowed ourselves to be judged by human standards, focusing on external practices and losing sight of the heart of worship. We admit to sometimes valuing the approval of others over your truth, and being swayed by the world's principles rather than being anchored in Christ. Forgive us for the times that we have engaged in self-imposed piety and false humility, neglecting the true source of our life in Christ. We repent for relying on our own efforts and not fully embracing the freedom you offer through your Son, Jesus Christ, who disarmed the powers and authorities triumphing over them by the cross. Amen. Let's now enter a moment of silent personal confession. This is a time to personally engage with God, to share the burdens of your heart, and to seek his forgiveness and guidance.
hear the assurance of God's unfailing love and forgiveness in Christ. You are accepted and your faith is counted as righteousness. Through his work on the cross, Christ has set us free from the judgments of the world and the tyranny of empty rules, calling us into the freedom of his grace. Be assured that in him we find our true identity and purpose, not bound by human regulations, but free to worship in spirit and truth. May this assurance of God's complete forgiveness and love empower you to live in the freedom of Christ has won for us. Firmly rooted in him and not swayed by the shifting shadows of the world, remain standing as we continue in worship this morning. Let's just sing that chorus one more time. Yeah, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves. Yeah, he loves us. us that you love us. It's that simple. You make us that promise day in and day out from the beginning of time till its end and beyond. And your word, your word is good. You say it and it is so. We're loved. We're loved by the one who made us loved by the one who made us to walk beside him through this world until the end of time. So as we continue forward along this path, the one that we're on right now in this world, in this time of your kingdom, God, hold our hands and remind us because, oh, we are forgetful. Your word is true. Remind us every time we forget, because we will and we do, that you love us, that you are here regardless. There's nothing that we can do. There's nothing that we can do to push you away. There's no depth we can hide in, no height we can run to that could separate us from the fact that you love us. And so as we continue in our time today, God, I just ask that you would, you would bless us with that. That you, being holy indeed, the fountain of all holiness, can let your spirit come upon us and make us holy so that we can be today and always the body of Christ. In your sweet name we pray. Amen.
All right. Good morning, Lost City Church. So glad so many of y'all were able to make it with the time change. For those of y'all that are still asleep, I don't endorse it. God so loves you. I don't know about myself, though. I am Ulysses Solis. This is my wife, April Solis. We are the Solis. Um, we are asked to say something that we love about Loft. For me, I would say how multicultural the worship is. There's des- definitely been times where songs are, are sang in Spanish, and that just reminds me of growing up in a Spanish-speaking church. Um, and I, I just really enjoy that and love that. Yes, and I'm April, and one thing I love about Loft is how involved we are in each other's lives. Like, three people just had babies, and so we have these back-to-back meal trains going on. I think that's great, Um, and I'm glad that we care enough about each other to do things like that. So, first announcement today, we have a trusty QR code on the slide right now where you can find info about our service and upcoming events and get more info if you are a visitor. Maybe it's your first time. Also, if you are a visitor, say hello to someone, and we would love to give you a small gift, a token of our appreciation. Okay, next announcement. Next announcement is the Faith and Works Healthy Leadership. It's Friday, March 22nd. It's, it's an event to help you in your work in in a secular work environment. Like many of us, myself included, we are in environments that are not Christian environments and it's difficult to navigate sometimes. Um, And this this event is an event that's happening quarterly to just help help you navigate through all of that and be able to communicate your faith to people and just be able to be in that environment. It'll be Friday, March 22nd at 6.30. Uh, register now and invite your friends, your family, um, and send the link to anyone you know. Okay, and then last we have Sabbath week. So I love this. After Easter Sunday, all of Loft takes a nice Sabbath week to rest. So yeah, we love rest. So you will not be having Bible studies. There won't be meetings or planning, things like that. So don't plan anything, I guess. No, but um, <laughs> no official planning. And we hope you take this time to enjoy the Lord, enjoy time with family and friends as we practice slowing down and reflecting, which for some of us, that's kind of hard. So it'll be good to have the extra time for that. And the Sunday after Easter, April 7th, we are having a church picnic. So I'm excited about that. Let's hope the weather is nice and not wet. Um, And this will mark the end of the Sabbath week and a great time to fellowship together. Yay. Okay, so then I, Kaylee's coming to give some final announcements. Hooray for the solaces. Okay, so my announcements are about Holy Week. And some of you, again, we've said this before, have come from traditions where this is a thing that you did. I did not. And so getting to be a part of Holy Week services for me really helped get my mind focused on Easter because I don't know about you, but sometimes I show up to Easter Sunday and it's like, it's Easter Sunday. And you're like, okay, Um, we are going to have Palm Sunday coming up in two weeks. And some of you didn't know, but our palms were actually from Israel last year. They were very special palms. I know you threw them all away. Way to go. Um, I don't know if we're getting the same deal this year, so don't. They're from Dallas, okay? Dallas Palms. You can shred them up and make bracelets with those. Um, Okay, but Monday, Thursday service. This is going to be with Mosaic like Ash Wednesday, except we're going over there. Um, This is just a really sweet time of reflection, again, getting your mind right. Also, this isn't like a test. You don't have to come to every one of these to pass or fail. Come to what you can. If you can't come, that's okay, but we just wanna give you times to pause, to reflect, and to direct your eyes towards Jesus. Good Friday service is always really special. I think just getting us in the mindset of that um, 
Jesus' death and to when that moment of Easter happens, just to celebrate the joy together, is just a great heart practice. So that's going to be um, on Friday, March 29th at Loft. And then Easter Sunday, guys, we're going to be together It's going to be such a sweet time. So we hope that you can come. We hope that these just are a part of serving your heart um, and worshiping God and that this liturgy can be something really sweet, really good, really beneficial. So um, with that, we have our giving time. I love the way that we talk about giving at Loft because we don't give to build our status or to say, okay, God, if I'm going to give you this, I want this. Like giving is purely out of the Holy Spirit's prompting, out of the motivation of their heart to say everything that I have, everything that I've been given, whether it's a secular job or a ministry job, every one of those dollars is a gift from the Lord. And so I become a steward of God's resources. And as such, I get to do fun things and give back to people. So if you would like to give back to this church, to your home church, we would love to see it. Um, But these are the different ways that you can give. And we just pray that as a family and as individuals, you'd be praying for what this looks like in our lives. Our church is growing. I don't know if you knew that but we are. And so um, we do have some needs and we will continue to share those with y'all in the future. But if you could be praying through that, we'd appreciate it. And now we're going to send our kids to kids church. Whoa, way more fun, but let me pray and y'all can get out of here. Wow. Way to go. Way to go. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this time to be together, to go through Colossians, to study your word, Um, and just to worship you. Lord, I thank you for this community. I thank you for these friends. I pray that this time is not just a time where we go through the motions, but it's a time where we can redirect our heart towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. Get out of here, kids. Go do something more fun. All right. Um... As the kids go, um, last week when you guys came in, um, we gave you a three by five card and invited you to specifically put a name down and ask um, and pray for that person that if God would open the door for you to be able to invite them to a home or um, share a meal with them or just send them an email or text or just to encourage or love them, someone who doesn't know Jesus, who has no relationship with Jesus, um, that in the hopes that through our acts of goodness and kindness that they would see that there's a father that loves them and cares for them. And and hopefully if the door opens that we could invite them to come and worship um, during Easter. This morning you received another card um, as you walked in. I think you did. If not, then there are cards in the back. But I want to invite us to pray again. But this time I want to invite you, hey, is there a way that God is calling me to intentionally bless um, this person this week. Um, So whatever that name was last week, maybe it's, hey, this week I am going to intentionally send them a text, or I'm going to go grab coffee with them, or I'm going to go just call them. Um, I know some of you guys, that's a foreign concept, but heard Nancy last week, but um, uh, call them and say hello. Um, I want to invite you to take that card out for a second, And ask Jesus, Jesus, where are you calling me to respond to this person? You put this person on my heart last week. Now, how how are you calling me to respond to this person this week? So I want to invite you to take a second, write that down, and I want to pray over you before we dive in this morning. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful that you have brought people into our lives, people that you love more than we love. Um, 
that you know them, that you care about them, that you know their lives, their stories, their concerns, their worries. And in your kindness, you have brought them into their lives. They might be family members. They might be coworkers. They might be neighbors. Um, and you have invited us to engage in our community, to engage in a way that by our good works, they would glorify the Father. And so God, oftentimes we relegate our faith to Sunday morning um, or to Bible studies, but um, where we forget that you have called us to love people. And so God, even as we pray today, as names have been written down, as ideas and um, thoughts have been written down of ways that we can bless people this week, God, would you give us boldness and courage to do that? God, I pray for every name that's been written last week, this week. Um, God, would you open doors where we can love well, we can point through our words and our actions toward Jesus. God, we know that you're the only hope, that you are the hope of this world in a world of brokenness and war and chaos and division and strife. The only answer is Jesus. And so, God, I just pray that you would give us opportunities this week to love well, to bless, to encourage, to point people to Jesus. So, God, we pray that you would use us for your glory and honor. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Also, Easter service, we're going to be blessed by having, I don't know if you guys know, but in our sanctuary on Sunday afternoons, there is a Persian church that meets here, and they sing and worship in Farsi. Um, they're going to join us for Easter service. And then Sunday evening, like I think at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock at night, a Russian church meets in here, and um, they might be joining us as well. So it's going to be a fun um, Easter service where we get to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus with um, several churches together. So I'm super excited about that. The Persian church has offered all of us breakfast. Um, I don't know what that means, but um, I will give you more details as we find out. But they want to bless us for us being a blessing to them. But we'll let you know details on that um, as soon as we find out. So very cool. Colossians 2 is where we're at. Colossians chapter 2. Over the last several weeks, we have been um, looking at the book of Colossians and this morning, we're going to be in Colossians 2, verses 16 through 23. Let me quickly recap where we have been before we dive into this morning. And we've noticed over the last several weeks that Paul is writing this letter to an obscure city, writing from a prison cell, reaching out to encourage this church, facing all sorts of pressures, facing all sorts of false teachings to pull them away from Jesus reminding them of treasures of mercy and progress and joy and completion that we have in Jesus. And he urges the believers there who are facing persecution to continue to live out their faith with the same fervor that when they first heard the gospel, that they would bear fruit in every good work and that they would grow in the knowledge of Jesus. We've explored over the last couple of weeks the challenges that the Colossian church faced. There were false teachers that were coming in, trying to diminish the divinity and the humanity of Jesus. And Paul, in his letter, would counter these distortions by reminding us of the supremacy of Jesus and his role as the God-man, calling the church to know Jesus personally and stand firm in the gospel in a myriad against a myriad of misleading voices. We looked at the temptation to minimize the authority of Jesus, encouraging us to confront the lies that lead us to doubt his control, his love, and instead, of the, instead to recognize the grandeur of a God who actively works in our lives. We were reminded of God's might and his supreme protective presence is amplified in the miraculous deliverance of missionaries that Keely talked about through divine intervention. Last week, we reflected on the foundational aspects of our faith, 
emphasizing salvation by grace through the sacrifice of Jesus, a gift that's beyond our merits. And the message of Paul to the Colossian church is about being rooted in a faith, that being rooted in Christ, that sets a vivid picture of faith that grows in strength and overflows with thankfulness. Regardless of the trials we face in life, that we could, in the midst of whatever we are experiencing, know that God is for us and we could be thankful. That our victory and our identity are firmly established in the transformative work of Jesus. This morning, we find ourselves at the heart of an important conversation about our walk with Jesus, one that navigates through the landscapes of rituals and regulations that leads us to hopefully embrace the grace that has been offered to us in Jesus. My prayer this morning is that we would be challenged to discern the difference between empty practices, rituals that we partake in, and the rich, transformative relationship that Christ offers us. So Colossians 2, 16 to 23, here's God's word. It says, Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink, or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what was to come. The sus- substance is Christ. Let no one condemn you by delighting in aesthetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. They don't hold on to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with growth from God. If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what, was, what is destined to perish by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. And although these have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. This morning we're going to look at four things from our text. The Number one, the sufficiency of Christ, which makes our efforts to earn salvation unnecessary. We're going to look at the danger of legalism. We're going to look at the liberating freedom that's found in Christ. And we're going to look at the substance of our faith, grace. Not as a concept, but in the very person of Jesus. So, number one, we're going to look at the sufficiency of Christ. The sufficiency of Christ. Some of you guys are old enough not to remember But many of us in this room grew up in a day and age when we didn't have cell phones. It's a crazy concept. I know some of you in this room are shocked and don't know what that world would look like. But I know, right? Um, And when cell phones first came out, they weren't even smartphones. So all you could do is basically call people. Whoa. Or you could text them eventually. And that was the only thing the machine could do. And so if you wanted to take a road trip, like a lot of folks are on spring break this week, there were several other things that you needed to bring along. For example, there was this thing called a map, and it was a paper map, right? And you had a destination and a, I mean, a start of place and a destination. You had to figure out how to get to your destination. Others of us had these things called a planner and had this agenda of all the things that we were going to do on our vacation. And then we had this thing called an actual camera. Like, as crazy as it sounds, it only took pictures. And then all of a sudden, Apple came along and this, with a smartphone, and wow, did it change the world. And when we talk about the sufficiency of Christ, we're referring to the idea that in him, we find everything that we need for a meaningful and fulfilled life. Imagine you're using a smartphone that fulfills, that promises to do all of that, to keep you connected, to manage your day, to help you figure out how to get where you need to go, to capture precious moments, and even entertain you when you're bored. You wouldn't need any other device. This one phone meets all your needs. And in a similar way, Christ is like that all-encompassing device for our spiritual, emotional, and actually our entire lives. There's no need to look elsewhere for 
extra devices or extra things or extra teachings to find peace and purpose and acceptance. It is all found in Jesus. But here's the thing. There's so many of us in the church that we have these extra devices. Right? You can almost know if you do because you could say, if only I had this, then my life would be truly happy. If only this happened for me, then everything would be great. Right? And I'm not saying those things are bad. But if your satisfaction and your joy in Jesus isn't what makes you truly satisfied, you will always be looking because the things that you look for will always fail you, always disappoint you. Martin Luther was, before the Reformation, was driven to find acceptance with God through works. And he said these words. He said, I tortured myself with prayer and fastings and vigils and freezing. The frost alone might have killed me. And elsewhere he wrote, when I was a monk, I wearied myself greatly for 15 years with daily sacrifice, torturing myself with things like fasting and vigils and prayers and other rigorous works. I earnestly thought that I could acquire righteousness by my works. And later, Luther would travel to Rome, and he would ascend the Scala Santa, supposedly the same, uh, travel to Jerusalem, and ascend the Scala Santa, supposedly the same steps that Jesus climbed when he appeared before Pilate. And Luther crawled on his knees, kissed every single step, praying the Lord's Prayer as he took those steps. And when he arrived to the top, he said, I don't even know whether this is true. All of these rituals and all of these things never made him any closer to God. Luther was striving, and Luther was doing everything within his human capacity to draw closer to God, to earn God's favor, and yet despite all of these efforts, the peace of God eluded him. The joy eluded him. And he later realized that righteousness demands, um, that God demands isn't something that we could achieve on our own. It's a gift that's given through faith in Christ alone. And that brings us to a crucial question, friends. How often do we find ourselves walking in Luther's shoes? How often do we even subconsciously slip into the belief that, God, maybe if I pray hard, maybe if I give more, maybe if I fast a little bit, maybe if I'm at church every single week, maybe if I do all these things, then I will earn your favor and you have to bless me. And you say, no, I don't do that. But what happens when your prayers aren't answered? What happens if you follow all of the things and God doesn't answer the prayer that you want the way you wanted it? How do you respond? Do you respond saying, but God, look at all I do for you. Look at the ways I give for you. Look at the ways I serve you. You have to answer me. Or do you respond, God, this doesn't make sense, but I've, I've got to trust you. I trust you in the midst of it. Friends, the sufficiency of Christ stands in stark contrast to this notion that our works and our actions earn God's favor. And Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, he dismantles this idea piece by piece, reminding us that in Jesus, we have been brought to fullness. We heard this already. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you are also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. That means you have been marked by Christ. Your whole self has been ruled by the flesh, has now been put off, and now you belong to Jesus. So what does that mean for us? It means that our striving, our rituals, our human efforts to make ourselves right with God are just unnecessary. They actually miss the entire point. Christ's work on the cross was complete, was perfect, was all sufficient. I said the word unnecessary. It doesn't mean simply that it's efforts that are additional or excess it means that our efforts are actually misdirected. It's doing stuff that we don't need to be doing. They represent our attempts to solve a problem that's already been solved, to pay a debt that's already been settled, 
His work on the cross wasn't a partial payment, and then we have to somehow make up the difference between what he paid and to complete the rest of the payment. That we do that through our works and our sacrifice and our striving. No, friends, his work was complete. His work was perfect. His work was all-sufficient, covering every sin, past, present, future, every shortcoming, and every aspect of our alienation from God. And when Jesus on the cross declared, it is finished, it was a definitive statement, echoing through eternity, even to today. And he wasn't merely signaling the end of his mission on earth, but he was announcing the completion of a mission that humanity could never accomplish on their own. That we could now be restored into relationship with God. That it was bridging the chasm between humanity and the divine, not with the efforts of our own good deeds, but with the finished sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And friends, this has profound implications on our lives because it liberates us from the endless striving of trying to earn God's love and acceptance, freeing us instead to enjoy and live in the joy and the peace of knowing that we are already loved. We are already accepted. We are fully embraced by God because of what Christ has done for us. And invites us then to not strive and work, but to live a life of gratitude and thankfulness and response, not a treadmill of earning and proving and working and wearing ourselves out. And not just that. Understand the sufficiency of Christ's work transforms our spiritual disciplines. It transforms our good works from being almost a currency that we use to purchase God's favor to now being a love language we speak in response to what he has done for us. Now our prayers, our fasting, our acts of service become expressions of our gratitude and love for Jesus. Not the price of admission into his presence. In essence, the unnecessary nature of our striving underlines the magnitude of Christ's accomplishment on the cross for us. The sufficiency of Christ calls us to reorient our lives around the central truth that we are saved by grace through faith, not through the work of our hands. And here it is. It's an invitation for us to rest. To rest, to know that no amount of striving, no amount of work is going to make God love me more but I get to rest knowing he loves me, that he deeply loves me, that he is for me, not against me. And they get to live out the days of my life in in his all-sufficient sacrifice for me. Think about the areas of your life where you're trying to earn God's favor. Is it through spiritual disciplines? Is it through volunteering and serving? Is it through giving? Now listen, all of these are good and godly pursuits, and I'm not saying don't do any of those, but they are not, they are the fruit of your salvation, not the root. They're the expressions of your love and gratitude toward God's not a means to earn his love. And in a world that tells us that we need to be more and do more and achieve more, the gospel stands as a beacon of hope, declaring, no, in Christ, everything has been done for you. We are enough. There is nothing else we need to do. Our acceptance before God isn't based on a spiritual resume. It is rooted in the righteousness of Jesus, imputed to us by faith. But here's the thing. For a lot of us, we know that in our heads. We have been taught that, we believe that, but we don't live it out in how we live every single day. And friends, there is danger there. I pray that we would find rest in the knowledge that our salvation is secure, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. We have to embrace the freedom that that comes from that knowing that Christ is enough. So we live out of a place, not of striving, but from a place of surrender, 
celebrating the sufficiency of his grace at work in our lives. Friends, this is the foundation on which we stand. Any other foundation is shaky. Any other foundation is not good because you never know if you've done enough or good enough or worthy enough for God to accept you. And if that's the foundation you stand on, you will never live embracing the love of God because you never know if you've done enough. Number two, the danger of legalism. It's a shadow of the truth. Look at verse 16, verse 17. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to a food and drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are the shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. Imagine walking on a sunny day and you notice your shadow on the ground. It moves as you move. It mimics your every action, and yet it lacks substance and depth and color. It's merely an outline on a pavement. The imagery is what Paul talks about here, that he cautions us against the dangers of legalism. Legalism, much like the shadow, has form but no substance. It promises you things. Legalism promises you things like, oh, righteousness and closeness with God through if you follow the rules and the rituals, but at the end of the day, it ultimately fails to deliver because it misses the heart of faith, which is a relationship and intimacy with Jesus. Legalism actually distracts you with the external, the measurable, the controllable, but faith invites you into a relationship that's vibrant, that's dynamic, that's life-giving. Think about the danger of this in your own lives. How easy it is for you to fall into the trap of measuring your spiritual health solely by your external behaviors. How often do we find ourselves comparing our religious activities with others? Oh, I'm at church every week, but they're not. Oh, I give so much, right? Secretly congratulating ourselves for how well we perform versus how well someone else performs. And we think that we're more spiritual than others because of what we do. And this is the essence of legalism. It shifts our focus from Jesus, who we are in Jesus, to what we do for Jesus. From relationship to regulation, from grace to performance. And instead of celebrating that, man, God is doing a work of grace in their lives and God is moving and working, we start comparing ourselves to other people. But Paul doesn't stop at just identifying the problem here. He points us back to the solution, which is Jesus himself. He reminds us that these rituals, these observances, were never meant to be the ultimate destination. That these were just signposts. These were just signs that were pointing us to Jesus, who is the substance of our faith. And just as a shadow indicates the presence of something that's real and tangible, these religious practices, Paul said, are actually pointing to the reality of Jesus coming, of his sacrifice, of his victory over sin and death. And here's where the rubber meets the road for many of us. Recognizing the danger of legalism in our lives isn't about about abandoning disciplines or neglecting communal worship. It's about examining the motives of why we do that. Why do we worship? Why do we give? Why do we serve? Are we seeking to manipulate God's favor or are we responding to his grace with joyful obedience? Are we living under the weight of all of these shoulds and musts and things I must do? Are we dancing in the freedom that we get to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords who has saved us and redeemed us and made us a part of his family? Are we doing it so that we could look well in front of others? Or are we doing it because Christ has been so good to us? How else can I but respond? Friends, as we navigate our faith journey, we need to be vigilant against the seduction of legalism because we can all fall into that trap. It's so easy. We could all quickly judge how well we do versus someone else does or how poorly we do versus someone else does. And what it does is it robs you of joy and freedom that's found in relationship with Jesus. So embrace the disciplines of our faith. 
not as a means to earn God's love, but a response to his love that's already been lavished on us. Our righteousness, our acceptance, our salvation are not contingent on our ability to adhere to a set of rules. They are already secure in Christ. So we walk in this truth, liberated from the shadows of legalism, fully alive in a vibrant relationship with Jesus. Let me give you a couple questions for you to consider as you think about it, of the danger of legalism in your own life. Number one, am I engaging in spiritual practices to genuinely connect with God? Or am I trying to earn his approval and the approval of others? Am I engaging in what I do to genuinely say, God, I want to connect with you. I want to hear from you. I want to listen to your voice. I want to talk to you. Or am I trying to earn his approval and the approval of others? Number two, do my spiritual routines bring me closer to understanding God's grace? Or they, do they feel more like checking check boxes that I think make me feel more acceptable to God? When you do your practices, when you do your disciplines, and we're going to spend months looking at spiritual disciplines and practices, but at the end of the day, do you do them so that you could check off a box? Or because do these things actually draw you closer to Christ? Really, do I live as though God's love for me is conditional on my actions? Or do I embrace the reality that his love is unchanging and my actions are a response to his grace? Do I live as though God's love for me is conditional on my actions? And if I have a bad day, then God's not going to give me any favor today? Or do I embrace the reality that his love for me never changes? That even in my worst, he loves me. Next, how do I reconcile my faith practices with the knowledge that salvation comes through faith in Christ alone, not through deeds or religious adherence? And then lastly, am I more concerned with how others perceive my spirituality than how God sees my heart? Do I fear man's judgment more than I rest in God's grace? Friends, here's the invitation of Jesus to us. To move from shadow to substance. From legalism to liberty, from performance to presence. As you fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith, of your faith, you let his grace be the rhythm of your lives. Legalism is a danger that all of us have to be careful of and protect and watch an eye in. And here's a third thing that we look at. Number three, freedom in Christ. In the heart of the book of Colossians, Paul presents to us this counterintuitive truth. That in dying with Christ, we are freed from the elemental spirits of this world. The statement, rich in theological depth, suggests that our unity with Christ in his death signifies a break from all of the rituals and practices of this world, including the notion that we can achieve righteousness by our own acts. Look at verse 20 and 21. If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to its regulations of don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Paul is inviting us here to a freedom that transcends the confines of religious regulations, a freedom that's birthed from our union in Christ and his death and resurrection. And Jesus calls us to something far greater than a life that's surrounded by do not do this and do not do that. He invites us to a life that's filled with joyful obedience, and freedom, rooted not in the fear of stepping out of line, but in the love of the one who has called us his own. And this freedom is not a freedom to, as an excuse for us to do whatever we want, but it's an avenue for genuine, heartfelt worship and service. When we are freed from the pressure to perform, we can now serve God and others out of a place of love and gratitude, not obligation. Paul talks about this in Galatians 1, he says these words, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm then 
and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. That word yoke of slavery refers to the same thing that he's talking about here in Colossians of this legalistic bondage, the burden of trying to earn God's favor through our own efforts. He says Christ's sacrifice on the cross has broken that yoke. And he's now inviting us to live a life of freedom and grace. How do we live in that freedom? It begins first and foremost with understanding our identity in Jesus. When you realize, when you deeply, to the core of your being, realize that you are deeply loved, that you are his beloved, that your worth is not tied to anything but Jesus, we serve not out of obligation, but out of love. We give not to earn God's favor, but for the gratitude for the grace that we received. We follow his teachings, not as a checklist for righteousness, but a response to his transformative work in our lives. And yet, friends, this freedom comes with a responsibility. N.T. Wright said these words. He said, Christian freedom doesn't mean being free to do whatever you want. It means being free to do what you ought to to live as God intended, reflecting his image in the world. Christian freedom means that you don't get to do whatever you want. You actually get to live the way God intended for you to live, where you get to reflect his image into the world. That means the freedom that we have in Christ should actually cause us to love more. It should cause us to serve more. It should cause us to go to those who are on the marginalized and care for them well. It should reflect the nature of Christ more fully in every aspect of our lives. There might be some of you in this room who are exploring Christianity. Understand this. Christianity is not about restrictive rules that bind your spirit, but it's about a relationship with Jesus that frees you to truly live, to live the way that Jesus actually intended for you to live. It's experiencing the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of God's love for you, a love so vast that it transcends any understanding that you have and sets you free. And as you embrace this freedom in Jesus, remember it's a freedom not from responsibility, but a freedom to live as we are meant to, connected to God, to each other for the purposes for which we are created. Let me ask you some questions here as you think about your freedom in Christ. How does the freedom I have influence my daily decisions and interactions? How does the freedom that I have in Jesus influence my daily decisions, my daily actions? Do I live as someone who is truly free? Or do I find myself bound by self-imposed rules and regulations? Next, do I see God's grace as a license for complacency? Or do I see God's grace as an empowerment for living a life that reflects his love and holiness? Do I see God's grace that he has loved me and he unconditionally loves me as a way to just simply be complacent in my walk with Jesus? Or do I actually find that empowering for living a life that reflects his love and his um, holiness? Number three, in my own spiritual life, Am I motivated more by fear of doing wrong and facing judgment or by love of God and the desire to live joyfully in the freedom that he offers? Then last, what does expressing my freedom? How do I use my freedom to serve others and glorify God without falling back into the trap of legalism? Where it doesn't become a duty, but you get to do it. You get to enjoy. You get to love people. Friends, let this, be the, let this freedom be the ground on which we stand, the air we, which we breathe, the song that we sing. May our lives be a testament that of the liberating power of the gospel, a beacon of hope in a world entangled with the chains of legalism and fear. In Christ, we have been set free so we don't have to live in bondage to legalism. We don't have to live in fear. We can be people who live counterculturally in the world that we live in. Last thing. This is the cornerstone truth that anchors 
our souls amidst everything else the world throws at us. In a world brimming with shadows of rituals and regulations and human efforts, trying to grasp the divine, Paul redirects our gaze to the one who is the embodiment of everything we long for and everything we need. And he invites us to cling to Jesus, the substance of our faith. We looked at this verse last week, and I want to just look at it real quick again. Verse 6 says, So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, being rooted and built up in him, and established in faith just as you were taught, overflowing with gratitude. Several years ago, during a British conference um, on comparative religions, experts from all over the world debated that if any belief, that if there was any belief that was unique to the Christian faith. And they began eliminating possibilities. Maybe it's the incarnation. But other religions had different versions of God appearing in human form. Maybe it's the resurrection. Again, other religions had some account of return from death. And the debate went on for some time, and this individual by the name of C.S. Lewis walked into the room, and he just asked, what is a rumpus about? Such a British word. And... And he heard in the reply of his colleagues that they were discussing Christianity's unique contribution among the world's religion. And without hesitation, C.S. Lewis said, that's easy. It's grace. It's grace. That's what Christianity offers that no other religion offers. It's grace. At the heart of our faith, it is a call, not that we work more, but an invitation to deeper dependence on Jesus. Not a ladder of achievements, but a person that we get to cling to. Jesus is not just another teacher or a prophet or a spiritual guide. He is the substance, the tangible reality of love and grace and truth that has been manifest to us. And clinging to Jesus means recognizing that he is the source of our life, our righteousness, and our ultimate fulfillment. It's understanding that every spiritual discipline, every act of obedience, every step of faith, again, is not about earning God's favor, but responding in overwhelming grace to who Jesus is in our lives. And it is this active, intentional posture of dependence and devotion that shapes every aspect of our lives. Clinging to Jesus is not a passive act. It is a vibrant, life-giving connection that sustains us daily. Think about the imagery that Jesus uses in John chapter 15. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Friends, Jesus doesn't mince words about our spiritual vitality. Just as branches draw vine, draw their life from the vine, so we draw our life, our righteousness, our fulfillment from Jesus. Whatever your spiritual discipline is that you enjoy, maybe fasting or praying or Sabbath or serving the least among of these, they are not transactions to earn God's favor, but expressions of our rootedness in him. Faith isn't about how much we do for God, but recognizing what God has already done for us. Our faith with God is not a ledger or a thing that we track, but a story of God's grace poured on us. I love how Ruth Padilla de Boris, who is a theologian from Costa Rica, puts it. She says, true discipleship is marked not by how fervently we strive, but how faithfully we surrender to Christ's work in and through us. That's what true discipleship is. Not by how fervently we strive, but how we faithfully surrender to Christ's work in and through us. Friends, that surrender is the integral part of clinging to Jesus. It is recognizing that our strength, our wisdom, our righteousness are not our own, but they are gifts from God, cultivated through relationship with Jesus. To cling to Jesus means that every act of obedience Every step of faith is a response to the grace that we've been given. It's recognizing that we are not orphans left to fend ourselves, that we are beloved children invited to sit at the table with Jesus. 
And as we do, our lives become testimonies of his grace, reflections of his love and vessels of his kingdom work on this earth. And so in light of that, our spiritual disciplines are not burdens, are not tasks, but they're blessings. These are invitations from Jesus for us to be connected to the Father, to be connected to Jesus. There are opportunities that he gives us to engage. So how do you engage with Jesus? Through prayer, through reading the word, through Sabbath, through giving, through communal worship. You, there are invitations that Jesus gives us so that we could be more deeply connected to him. So when we read scripture, we dive into the depths of God's love for us, finding guidance and comfort and challenge. As we serve, we embody the love of Jesus, extending his hand and feet in a world that's desperately in need of hope. And as we pray, we get to talk to the one who not just made us, but loves us and died for us, who calls us friends. Clinging to Jesus transforms our perspective on obedience. It's no longer about striving for acceptance, but living out the acceptance that we already possess. Let me ask you some questions here as well. How deeply am I clinging to Christ in my daily life? Is my relationship with him the foundation of my faith? Or am I holding on to other things for security? In moments of difficulty or dis- decision, Do I first turn to Jesus as a source of strength and guidance? Or do I rely on my own wisdom and resources? And Jesus is there in the back pocket in case I can't figure it out on my own. How does my faith in Jesus as a substance of everything I believe influence my actions, my decisions, my interactions with others? How does your faith play out in your relationship with your spouse, in your parenting, as a child towards your parent, in your work, in your school? How does your faith influence that? Or is it disconnected? Is it my faith is just Sunday mornings and Bible studies, but then not anywhere else? And lastly, am I growing in my understanding an experience of grace as I cling to Jesus, or am I stagnant? I'm doing everything, but there's no change. There's no transformation. I'm still clinging to old habits and ways of thinking. Am I growing in my understanding and experience of grace? Let me wrap up. Let me just quickly just highlight these four points again and just say four what, so what? Number one, the sufficiency of Christ reminds us that the relationship of Jesus, our relationship with God isn't based on what we do, but on what Christ has already done for us. So what does that mean? It means that we could seize our striving for approval and we can rest in the assurance that we are fully loved, fully accepted, fully forgiven because of Jesus. Number two, the danger of legalism warns us against the emptiness of a faith built on human rules rather than relationship. What does that mean? It invites us to examine our motives, to ask ourselves whether we're serving God out of obligation, and to reprioritize our heart's posture, more than just conforming and doing things, but to be deeply in relationship with Jesus. Number three, freedom in Christ liberates us from the chains of don't touch, don't taste, don't handle, inviting us into a life marked by grace-driven effort, not guilt-driven toil. So what does that mean for us? It means that we get to live boldly for Jesus, making choices rooted in love and wisdom, not in fear and compulsion. And finally, clinging to Jesus challenges us that in all that we do to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, he is the source of our strength. He's the answers to our prayer. He's our joy. He's our salvation. So why does that matter? It means that we daily choose to deepen our relationship with him through the practices of our faith, like prayer and scripture and worship and community, finding in him the strength to face whatever life throws at us. And as we do that, 
It shifts our perspective from religion to, and rules to a relationship with God. It transforms our service from duty to the light. It changes our obedience from a burden to a blessing. And most importantly, it anchors our identity not in what we do for Jesus, but in what he has already done for us. We're getting ready to go into communion. And I want to invite you to a moment of intimate reflection and personal response. Communion is a sacred time to remember the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, his body broken for us, his blood shed for us. I want to invite you to meditate on the sermon and to bring to Jesus whatever he is convicting you of this morning. And when you're ready this morning, I'm going to invite you to come down the aisles and grab the elements, return to your seat. You can choose as the worship team sings to whether to sit or stand. But this is your personal time with the Lord. A moment to respond to whatever the Holy Spirit is leading you toward this morning. And if you need prayer this morning, the prayer team is available in the back, ready to pray with you, whether it's something from this morning's sermon or whatever need you may have in your life. In the next few moments, let's allow the truths that we've explored to sink deep into our hearts. Let's respond to God's stirring, embrace the freedom that he offers. Let's cling to Jesus our Savior. Let's worship.
about this morning because this table represents Jesus that in him we find our sufficiency freedom from legalism and the invitation to live lives deeply rooted in his love so as we take the bread in our hands this bread represents the body of Christ that was broken for us and as we eat this bread remember the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice his body was given so that we could be made whole so that things like rituals and regulations that once defined us no longer have a hold on us. So as we read this, let's take this bread and let's celebrate the Lord's death on our lives. Let's take the cup. This cup represents the blood of Christ that was shed for us. The juice is a symbol of the new covenant made possible through the blood of Jesus that was spilled. His blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins, inviting us now to live a life of freedom beyond regulations, beyond rules. We have been cleansed, made new, and invited to claim to Christ the substance of our faith. Let's drink together. Let's continue in worship this morning. You see the empty 
shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the knowledge of the sufficiency of Christ fill you with peace and the freedom that you have empower you to live beyond constraints this week and live your life for Jesus. Love City, we love you. God bless you. We'll see you next week.